Uh, Merry Christmas and happy holidays. I'm Stephen. In case you didn't know, I'm the lead pastor at Madison Church. And thank you for being here today, our first week in person for Advent. We started Advent as we usually do online only. It's Thanksgiving weekend, and so online only. And um, it's that time of year again, as you're probably driving around, you're noticing all the twinkling lights on the houses and the buildings and the trees. Uh, Christmas cards are arriving. Have any of you sent Christmas cards already? Anyone? Nope, nope, no, 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 no Christmas cards. Let us know online if you send Christmas cards out. Um, ugly sweaters are being worn all the time, justifiably though, this time of year, right? I mean, there's, some of you wear them year round, that's fine, but uh, we can call out uh, in December. Uh, these are just some of the factors, in my opinion, that make this time of year the most wonderful time of year. When I asked last week online, hey, what, what are you most looking forward to? Uh, most of the people said family and friends. And so you guys are way deeper and more relaxed relational and compassionate than I am. Because I was like, I love peppermint mochas and red stuck cups at Starbucks. And I love getting presents. So like I said, you guys are deep. I'm a little shallow, but um, I'm wondering how many of you got your Christmas decorating done? So none of you sent out cards. So how many of you got your decorating done? A few, a few. You only got three weeks left, guys. I mean, it's got to get done today. Otherwise, I don't want to discourage you, but maybe this isn't the year, okay? You got three weeks until showtime. Um, as of Friday night, my house is probably as decorated as we're going to do. Anything that's not out of the box is staying in the box now. And uh, you know what's frustrating every year? I don't know if I'm the only one who this happens to, but like, as we're unpacking stuff, I'm like, where are the rest of my whatever lights this year? I get halfway through the Christmas tree, putting the lights on it, and it's only halfway done, and there are no more lights. Like, well, I know the Christmas tree has been lit the last five years, top to bottom. Where did the other half of my lights go? But it's not just the lights. It's, it's this or that. Where did that guy go? Where did this thing go? And where does our nativity scene? That's been missing for like three years. I know we didn't throw it away. We wouldn't do that. We wouldn't, we'd not risk throwing away a little baby Jesus statue. Okay, we wouldn't do that. But we lose these things, and every year it's frustrating. It's, Am I alone? Yes, I am. Okay. I am alone. I'm the only one who loses. So then every year I got to go to Home Depot and I'm buying lights that I know I bought last year or three years ago. And I'm like, and you know what's going to happen next year? I'm going to find them all. I'm going to have more lights than I know what to do with. And I'm going to give them away. And then in a couple of years, I'm going to be back to Home Depot. It's a, it's a vicious cycle. But okay. So since you guys don't lose Christmas stuff, have you ever lost money before? So, I mean, it's been a while, right? Because, I mean, debit cards, credit cards, we're not really carrying around a whole lot of cash. I can remember being a teenager and, and trying to hide away cash, and then I hid it so well, I, I was protected from me. It was just so well. And sometimes we're a little too ambitious. And what do we do when we lose money? Or if you did, you probably turn the whole house upside down looking for it. I mean, you're looking for it, money with places that you would, like, why would the money be there? Like couch cushions. You're like, well, maybe I put 200 bucks in the couch cushions. Why would you do that? In the freezer, maybe. And then lo and behold, it is in a weird place like that. You know, it's under the mattress. How about a pet? And if any of you had the, you've been scared, you lost your pet before, uh, you let Fido outside, but Fido never came back. Come on, man. Your cat darted out the door and they're a little bit trickier than the dogs. So the dog you watch leave to go outside, the cats, you might not know. They're a little stealthier. You know, they kind of dart out there. And then maybe like three days later, you're like, has anyone seen Spot? Nobody names their cat Spot, right? I'm a dog guy. So, but has anyone seen our cat? And so what do we do when we lose a cat? We put out the little posters everywhere because we're trying to rally our neighbors. Hey, if you see my dog, you see my cat, please call and let me know. You might offer a little bit of money, depending how much you like the animal. Sometimes I, I judge them a little bit. Like I'll, I'll see a sign. I'll be like, how much we're offering five bucks. They don't want that cat back. That's what I, <laughs> and then I'm like, I see the ones that are 500. I'm like, oh, that is a good dog. I might, you know what? I might keep that dog if I find it. No, I would never, but we do that. We, we, and there's Facebook groups now, right? Where you can say, Hey, I lost my pet around here. Please let me know. Um, have any of you with kids, have you ever lost a child before? Hopefully not permanently. You know, how many of you have lost someone else's kid? No one. Okay. Yeah, okay, we got a couple people. You've lost someone else's kid. You're not worried about them. You're always worried about your own, right? I'm not sure. I, and look, you know, pets are like family too. I get that. There is just a little bit something more, even in a societal approach when we lose a kid, right? We have Amber Alerts. There are no alerts nationally for a lost dog. But when a kid gets lost or taken... Um, we the whole community rallies around together. Reward, or, I mean, we don't care about the reward. We just want to bring a kid home. Uh, we 
Megan and I, we lost one of our kids, Oliver. Uh, we did find him. He's here today. But we lost him at Zoo Lights. Have any of you guys been to the Zoo Lights in Madison? Very nice. If you haven't been to the Zoo Lights, you got to go before this year's over. If you like Christmas lights, it's awesome. The only scary thing is like you hear a twig break. And you're like, is there a lion hunting me down? It's in the dark. I can't see. Um, and so I hope that they can't see either. But uh, we went to the zoo lights. And so, yeah, it's dark. You're walking around with like a spiked hot chocolate, looking at all these great lights. And then at some point, like Oliver and Elijah, they just are two kids. They're just running around us in circles, which is great because we know they're going to get to the car and just pass out, which is what we're really hoping for anyway. And so, but at some point, our, our little two became one. And we were like, oh, hey, we're missing a kid. And then the panic starts to set in, right? Because you're like, there's two ways. And your worst case scenario is where your mind goes. And so I'm thinking there's two ways in and out of the park, okay? So we got to get the entrances and exits covered. And Megan's like, we had two different approaches. Megan's just running now. She's like, I'm going to run and I'm going to find him. And, and I stay put because so I'm like, well, you know what? Maybe that little prankster's screwing around with us. So I'll stay here. Megan, you run around. And, and thankfully that night, there was another family who noticed that, you know what, a four-year-old should not be walking around the zoo lights by themselves. This guy's probably lost. They picked up Oliver. They stayed in one place. We found him and it was, oh, it was exhaling. And, uh, you know, we chewed him out, of course. That's what good parents do. We're like, what's wrong with you? Why would you get lost? Of course he didn't mean to get lost. Who intentionally plans to get lost? It's not like my Christmas lights are getting lost. You know, maybe your cat purposely is trying to run away and ditch you, but getting lost is something that usually we don't do on purpose, but it happens to us. And oftentimes we don't know we're lost until somebody points it out to us. And then it's, it's scary. And it might surprise you, but it might not. But losing something and specifically someone, losing something or someone is a feeling that God knows well. It's a feeling that he's feeling today. It's a feeling that God has felt throughout all of, of humanity of people being lost, of people being separated from him. And last week we did start a series uh, going through Advent. And I said that the reason for Christmas, I still stand by this, but the reason for Christmas, our substantial reason for Christmas is love. It's all about love and specifically God's love for you and God's love for me, God's love for us, for every person who has ever lived. And Without God's love for you and me, I mean, Christmas would be fine, but it'd be very materialistic and consumeristic. I mean, that'd be the reason we're getting together every year to put up trees and lights and exchange gifts. But Christmas, God's love gives us a substantial reason to celebrate beyond the materialism. John, one of Jesus' closest friends on earth, he writes, for this is how we know. This is how we know God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. And it is this love that turned the world upside down. And maybe if you were with us online last week or you caught the message on YouTube or podcast, you said, okay, God loves us so much, but why did Jesus have to come? Like, God loves us, so he sent Jesus. But maybe let's back up one question. Why did God have to do that? Well, we were separated from God. There was a separation. We read about that in the first few pages of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, that there's a separation, that there's something that we were with God. We had perfect communion and community and relationship with God, but then something happened that separated us. And so because God loves us, God wants to know you. God wants you to know him. He sends Jesus because of love so that he can restore and reconnect us with him. So when we think of Christmas and the substantial reasons that we celebrate, we ought to think of God's love first and foremost and see that that love motivated him to send Jesus to earth on a mission. Jesus didn't just come to earth to be a good person, to show us an example of a, of a way that we should live so that you can be a good person and, and check that off the list. But he came for a more substantial reason than that on a mission. And last week I shared a story about a woman who was a, a prostitute who experienced the love of God, the love of Jesus in a profound way. And today I want to tell you the story of a tax collector. And just like the woman from last week, everyone knew who this guy, this tax collector was, and no one liked him. I mean, who likes the IRS anyway? He was a mod, uh, an ancient version of the IRS, and he was good at it, apparently. Because if, if you're reading in Luke 19, uh, the story of a man named Zacchaeus, you read a couple things about him. One, he's very short, which, I mean, how would you like that to be? You're in the Bible forever. And it's gonna, we're going to sell millions and billions of copies of this book. And the one thing people are going to know about you, one, is that you're short. I mean, that's, come on, man, Luke, you're really going to do that to me? And then the second thing is that he's very rich. 
Now, back in the day, if you were a tax collector, the Roman Empire would say, let's say it's Judd as our tax collector, and say, Judd, here's how much money we need you to get from this providence. That's how much we know. It's kind of like our IRS. They know how much you know, but yet every year we have to like figure it out ourselves. And they're like, well, we'll, we'll double check you. And it's, why? Well, if you know, how come? Okay, never mind. But so that's what Zacchaeus would do. He would go around and say, hey, I got to collect this. Now, the Roman Empire wasn't going to pay you for doing this job. They'd say, hey, Judd, just take however much you think you're worth. Zacchaeus obviously thought he was worth a lot because we find out that he's very rich. And so he's coming to you and he's saying, oh, yeah, Lindsay, I think you owe this much. And then let's say this much. And you're looking at him and you're like, no, I know I don't owe that much. You can't argue with him because he's sent by the Roman Empire. And if you don't get in line, you'll get thrown behind bars. And so you're like, yeah, I guess I just got to pay him. And, and he lived next door to you or he lived in your community. <laughs> He was just there. And so everyone knows who this is. This guy is. Nobody likes him. He's short. Luke, he must have collected taxes for Luke. That's what it is. It's all coming to me now. He collected taxes from Luke. And Luke was like, I'm going to throw a little shot here at him. But one day Jesus is coming to town. And he's walking through town. He's already started doing miracles and teachings. And people are listening. And uh, they're starting to, he has a reputation. So the crowds start to form. The people who want to hear from Jesus, want to experience Jesus, they're all gathering around Jesus, kind of like most of us are today, where a lot of people are a lot of places in churches. We're coming because we want to experience Jesus. And so we're all coming. Now, there was such a crowd that Zacchaeus, being the short little man he was, he could not see. And so Zacchaeus hops up a tree so that he can see Jesus. Jesus continues to walk. The crowds are around him. Jesus sees this little short man up in the tree. He tells Zacchaeus, get down. I'm going to have dinner with you tonight. And just like the story from last week when the woman comes in and cries on Jesus's feet and, and all the religious people are like, oh my gosh, if this guy was really the son of God, I mean, shoot, if this guy was just a prophet, he wouldn't let her, a woman like her, touch him. The religious leaders again are like, if this guy was the son of God, if this guy was a prophet, he would know who this guy is. He's a terrible guy and he wouldn't be talking to him. And Jesus invites himself over for dinner. And so they're like appalled. Again, why would Jesus do this? We don't know what happens at dinner, but what we do know is that Zacchaeus says, you know what? I'm going to pay back everyone that I've stolen from up to four times more, which was double what the law insisted or told him that he had to pay. So if you stole from someone, the law said you have to pay him back times two. And Zacchaeus, he's had such an encounter with Jesus over dinner, says, I'm going to do not, uh, such above and beyond what the law requires. I'm going to do double what the law requires. And then I'm going to give half of whatever's left over to the poor. I mean, that's quite the life transformation. For those of you who are followers of Jesus, I bet you know you came up and you, you followed Jesus and you, you experienced his love and his presence and this profound. I doubt you then opened up your banking app. So let me see how much money I can give away now to show that I've become a follower of Jesus. And this isn't like a prescriptive model that when you find Jesus, you give away half of your wealth. That's not what this is, but it is to show that Zacchaeus had his life changed. He went from being a crook and a really good crook at that to completely changed. Scholar Craig Keener describes the sudden change of heart this way. He says, in ancient accounts of discipleship, a radical response with possessions was a certain sign of a newly acquired devotion to the teacher. Keener is saying, in that society, if you were all in, you did something radical to show just how all in you were. So if Zacchaeus says, yeah, I'll pay back everybody I've wronged. That's great. That's a good first step. And that shows a commitment to Jesus. But the commitment that Zacchaeus made where he's, I'm going to double what the law requires. I'm going to give away half the poor. It shows a very big, in Zacchaeus's mind, radical change. Zacchaeus is all in. And Jesus responds to whoever's there witnessing this. And we know that there were more people witnessing it. But he says, the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. So we see in Jesus' own words, he identifies a mission. I didn't just come here to love. I didn't just come here to show the world a better way, but I came to seek and save those who are lost. This Christmas, we reflect that the world was turned upside down because God so loved the world, he gave the Son of Man who came to seek and save the lost. Now I need to state the obvious right now. Lost is a term that can invoke a variety of mostly, if not uh, exclusively, negative emotions, right? We hear the word lost, 
it's, it's mostly negative emotions. And I get it because Christians, to which I am one, I'm a follower of Jesus. Many of you are, you're watching, listening online, you might be. We have to be accountable and responsible here. Um, we have largely thrown the term around lost about certain people with kind of a level of arrogance and superiority. That's almost the only time I've ever heard that word used, lost, is when Christians are referring to themselves as better than whoever those are. Jesus wasn't lost, but Zacchaeus was. Jesus wasn't lost. I'm not lost, but Mary, the prostitute from last week, was. And it's arrogant. And it's a way of communicating in some respects that I'm right. What I believe about the world is right. What I believe about God is right. And you're wrong. You're lost. And then we kind of dig it a step further. And if you want to be found, then you have to think about the world and God the way that I do. That is how you get found. So no wonder we live in a society in which we hear the word lost, which we can't get around, is mentioned. Jesus mentions coming in to seek and save the lost. We can't ignore that that's in the Bible, in the New Testament. But we have to take responsibility for how we have misused it, because that's not how Jesus ever used the term lost. As I opened with, when we lose something, we don't think of ourselves as better than the thing or the person lost. When Oliver got lost at the zoo, I did not think I was better than Oliver. When you lost your money, you didn't think you were better than your money. You didn't think, oh, if my dog was my level of superiority, they wouldn't have been lost. We don't think that. What happens when something is lost is we're so moved by compassion, we're moved to obsession. We want to find that which is lost. We want to find that which is unfound. (laughs) Motivated by compassion, it becomes our obsession. And that is how we see Jesus respond to those who are lost. It's compassion that he came and it's an obsession of his mission that he lives on. In Paul's words, God wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth. God wants everyone. There's no exclusion. He wants everyone. Every single one of you in the room, you're watching or listening online, God wants you to be with him, to understand the truth. Peter writes something similar in case you're curious from a different angle. God does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. When you combine those two passages, you get this message that God wants everyone to be saved and does not want anyone to be separated from him. God lets us know his intent plainly throughout the New Testament, and that is he has a compassion for humanity that has driven him to an obsession to seek and save the lost. And as I mentioned last week, we're told to love each other, not as we want to be loved, but as Jesus loves us. In John 13, 34, we read, love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other, which is a hard message. Because I don't always want to love people the way that I think that they deserve to be loved, let alone the way that Jesus has loved them. And what does he say? He continues, right? The very next verse, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. We keep asking this question, what does God's love require from me? It's not an argument to be won. It's not a battle to be won. People far from God don't need to be convinced that I think the right things about God. They need to be shown the love of God. That is where we will win or lose. And our compassion, our compassion for our family, our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors, our compassion toward them should drive us toward an obsession about them. And that obsession should be showing them the love that Jesus has for them. And that is when we begin to see the lost being found. Now, I want to say, for many of us, when we hear Christians talking about folks being lost, we tend to think of something like this. I got a nice little picture for you. You're either in or out, right? I mean, that's the, that's the image that we get. You're either in or out. I made a decision. I said a prayer. I was baptized. I'm in and you're out. I am found, and you are lost. But I believe that the next diagram is more accurate of the way that we see biblical discipleship and following Jesus talked about. You see, we see people moving toward Jesus, 
We see people moving away from Jesus. At any given time, I might be moving toward Jesus. You might be moving toward Jesus. But we also have to be humble enough to recognize that I might make some decisions, whether that's in my marriage or with my finances, with my relationships, that I begin to move away. See, discipleship isn't just a, I said a prayer one time and I was baptized one time a long time ago and I give a little money to church occasionally. That's not it. Discipleship is I am pursuing Jesus every day, every choice that I am making. I'm constantly trying because there's a reality that today I could be found and tomorrow I could not be. Today I might be so close to Jesus, but then I get lazy. I just don't care. I get apathetic. And days turn into weeks, and weeks turn into months, months turn into years, and pretty soon I find myself, where am I? I find myself probably in all of her shoes looking around saying, is anyone here? And as we seek him out and we go and we say, I want to follow the cross and I want to follow Jesus, in what areas of our lives are we found or lost today? Is it with our marriage? Is it with our family? Is it financially? Is it emotionally? Is it with our mental health? Of course, all of these things are spiritual. It means that we can be lost in a variety of different ways. It means we can be found in a variety of different ways. But the pursuit of Jesus is to try to find those areas that we don't know where we're at, the areas that we're lost, and turn those over to him. And that requires us to be humble like Jesus and like the New Testament tells us to be. It's not a matter of looking to your left and to your right and telling you know, you need to do this, you're lost. But it's rather looking inward at myself and saying, in which ways am I lost? Because when I can recognize that and take responsibility for my faith walk and I can begin to love other people as Jesus has loved them, that's when, if you're really interested, <laughs> if you're interested in the people you work with, your neighbors, family, friends, finding and following Jesus, love them like Jesus. That doesn't mean we don't have answers to their questions. You guys who have come to Madison Church for a long time know that once a year we do a big series on a topic called apologetics, in which we're going to talk about how we got the Bible and, and, and why we can trust the Bible and who is Jesus and was he historic and how did Jesus think of it. We'll do all of those things. But oftentimes we want to lead with that step and that's not the right step. The right step is to first establish a foundation of loving someone as Jesus did. And if you're going to argue with someone first, before you've established that you love them, you're actually pushing them further away from Jesus, and you're working against that mission of seeking and saving the lost. This Christmas, Jesus wants to find us. I mean, Christmas is all about God showing up in Jesus to make sure that everyone is found and that no one is lost. And so this Christmas, as we go into the next few weeks and studying and go into next year, let's reorient ourselves because of God's love and our love for other people to move closer and closer to the person, the priorities, and practices of Jesus. And I pray that for some of you today who are making that declaration of faith, that you do step forward in that commitment to following Jesus. That's exciting. We're told in the, in the New Testament that heaven celebrates when people make that decision. And so I hope that whether it's online or in the room, that we've give. We've given heaven a reason to celebrate this morning. But if that's not where you are at, for the rest of us in the room, having the priorities of Jesus and the practices of Jesus, that means this week showing people the love of Jesus, the love that Jesus has. And you might say, they won't appreciate it. They don't care. They won't notice. You might just begin to understand how Jesus felt carrying a cross to a hill as people watched him. And yet he loved them anyway and did it. Even though they didn't recognize it, they didn't appreciate it, they disrespected him, they wanted him dead, and yet Jesus loved him. And so we understand that, and then all of a sudden, that, with that little teaching that Jesus had, you have to you know, carry your cross. Maybe this week, carrying your cross means showing someone love, the love of Jesus, and they're never going to show you appreciation for it. That might just be what that is. The Christmas story is all about the incarnation, about a God who loves you so much, with a mission to seek you out and to find you. And he wants to extend that mission to all of us today. 